मैडम आपण जर व्हाट्सएप रे पठेली देखंतो हैला 92 हैव जॉइंड ऑलरेडी 94 हैव जॉइंड या आई विल जस्ट गेट माय वाटर फॉर माय सेल्फ या या दैट इज इंपॉर्टेंट या आई आल्सो Yes. Let me also get some water for myself. Yes. <laughs> It's two hours, no? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody with their waters, bottles of waters. <laughs> no, how are things there in your place? Things are very bad where I stay in Kolkata. Yeah, here also it's raining heavily. Lot of tree falling. Oh, lot of. Oh, 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 oh,
at least four out of ten women have been uh, have lost their jobs due to this pandemic. And what we are witnessing in this current scenario has been described by an economist as a cessation. So not only uh, in terms of employment or livelihood, but also as far as uh, access to food and uh, access to healthcare, reproductive um, uh, care, healthcare, and also the food and nutritional security, uh, access to sanitation, etc., has definitely this COVID-19 pandemic has serious uh, repercussions. Uh, now there has been a surge in domestic violence, uh, which led uh, it to be described as uh, a shadow pandemic by the UN woman. The stay home, uh, stay safe tagline has actually uh, brought out an irony in the sense that uh, uh, many women have been forced to stay in home uh, uh, with their abusers or the perpetrators of uh, violence. Uh, so this uh, lockdown has resulted in uh, not only uh, women being locked in, but also uh, down and uh, but as I've already said, uh, there has not been uh, much serious thought uh, regarding uh, its implications uh, for women. So we have a very distinguished um, uh, panel uh, to navigate uh, to help us to navigate uh, through these issues. That is how this COVID-19 pandemic has impacted uh, women in. Um, various ways. Uh, uh, now I take this opportunity to give a brief introduction of our uh, distinguished guests, uh, uh, at least for the sake of the students. Uh, I know it will really take a very long time if I really introduce them, uh, but so I would be very brief. Uh, our first speaker for today's webinar is uh, Professor Mary John. Uh, so she's an alumnus of uh, JNU and also she has a PhD from University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, uh, currently, she is a professor uh, at the Center for Women's Development Studies. Uh, she was a uh, director of this particular center from 2006 to 2012. Prior to that, uh, she was associated with uh, JNU in the capacity of uh, uh, associate professor and also joint director of uh, the Center for Women's Studies. Uh, now, our uh, next speaker is Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay. <laughs> she is currently the professor of economics uh, and also the former director of Women's Studies Center at uh, University of uh, Calcutta. She is also uh, the coordinator of the Eastern um, uh, Region uh, of Indian um, Women's um, uh, Indian Association for Women's Studies. Uh, now we have our next speaker, uh, Professor Asahans. Uh, uh, Professor Asahans is the founder director of uh, School of Women's Studies, uh, as well as former professor of political science at Utkal University. Uh, she has really left uh, deep imprints on the evolution and the strengthening of uh, the women's studies as an academic discipline in Odisha. She is also the co-chair of uh, Pakistan uh, India the People's Forum for Peace and Democracy. Currently, she is uh, uh, the president of uh, uh, one organization, Sansristi, which has been doing tremendous work uh, in various fields, uh, including the gender issues. Uh, our uh, final speaker is Professor Bibhuti Patel. Uh, uh, she is an alumnus of uh, University of Mumbai and also she is currently uh, associated with uh, as a professor uh, with uh, advanced center for women's studies and in school of development studies of Tata Institute of Social Sciences uh, Mumbai prior to that she was working as a professor of economics in SNDT University Mumbai which has the distinction of not only being the first uh, women's university in India but also in the Southeast East Asia. Uh, all our distinguished speakers have uh, received uh, uh, critical acclaim for their publications. I'm not going into the details of it. Uh, in addition to their uh, stellar scholarship, they have also, uh, are, they are also known for their passionate activism. So we are really fortunate uh, to have these uh, distinguished speakers in our midst. Uh, I don't uh, really need to introduce our uh, uh, beloved Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Isan Kumar Patra. 
in addition to being a, uh, actually a very distinguished uh, neuroscientist, uh, not only really also well known uh, abroad, of, um, being at the helm of uh, this institute, really Galvez a community towards excellence. We are grateful to you, sir, for your presence. Uh, with these, once again, I welcome all of you to this webinar. Now I um, hand over this platform to Dr. Bikram Keshari Misra to uh, carry forward the proceeding. Dr. Misra, please. Uh, thank you, Madam, uh, esteemed Vice Chancellor, the Chair of the Day, uh, esteemed uh, Resource Persons, uh, Professor Mary Joon, uh, Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay, Professor Asa Hans, Professor Vibhuti Patel, uh, delegates and participants from across the country. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. I am indeed grateful to uh, Professor Oshima Sahu, uh, the uh, Director of the Center for Women's Studies, Professor of Political Science, and Dean School of Social Sciences, for giving me this opportunity uh, to uh, coordinate this session. Uh, we have with us uh, scholars in gender studies uh, from across the country. Um, uh, <coughs> already, Madam has given the introduction. Uh, Professor Mary Jung, who was in JNU, who was in DU, and currently she is in CWDS. And Bibuti Madam, who is a practicing gender specialist in TIS. Uh, uh, Mary, uh, Dr. Asa Hans, she was the founder, uh, uh, director, Center of Women's Studies. And Ishida Madam, she is a practicing gender expert in uh, Calcutta University. Uh, indeed, we are honored with this galaxy of intellectuals. There can be no better way of having a discussion on analyzing the impact of gender um, COVID 19 on, uh, on women than this. Uh, without uh, 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 making more delay, I now humbly request Professor Mary Joan to share her um, webinar lecture. Yes, thank you, madam. Uh, good morning. Uh, first, let me thank um, Ravenshaw University for inviting me to be part of this panel discussion. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Mishra, Asima and all those who I know have worked very hard, the ones behind the screens today who are doing everything to make this possible. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity and I look forward to a very good discussion on a very, this is, this is what we are living with. We are trying to reflect on a situation that is unfolding day by day. Um, never before, I think, have any of us been in such a situation and never before have we had to reflect and try and assess the situation that we are in. I mean, I, I just want to emphasize how unique uh, this is in every way and the extent to which indeed this is not something anticipated. This is not something in which we have the answers. This is not something in which um, even the scientists are in control, uh, leading less, uh, you know, let alone uh, political leaders. So, um, so we are all finding our way here. We are all trying to put to use as best as possible the, um, shall I say, the scholarship that we have, the reflective capacities that we have. Um, and so we are learning all the time. For instance, so I thought I would begin just by mentioning that I, you know, in being in the midst of this particular pandemic, this particular virus, uh, we have suddenly become knowledgeable about prior pandemics. Um, I, for one, did not know about the Spanish pandemic, the so-called Spanish flu of 1918. I don't know how many of you maybe were aware of it. Um, this was a flu that uh, ravaged the world after World War I uh, and possibly, be and it's largely been forgotten by history. Even though it affected one third of the world's population, that's the estimate, 500 million people, it killed one tenth of those people, at least 50 million. It killed many in our own country. It killed people in, in the city of Bombay. It killed people in Bangalore, in my own hometown. Uh, and yet somehow it has been submerged from, from our memory uh, compared to the present one, which we are living through and so on. So I just thought to compare in a way, what we're living through today is actually not in terms of its severity, in terms of epidemic severity, is not supposedly as severe as that pandemic was. That pandemic uh, took one tenth of our lives. Here it is very. Toddlers, 
infants. That is not the pattern here. In fact, curiously, this particular, even though, as I think Asima mentioned, the, the pandemic, uh, today's pandemic doesn't uh, choose who it's going to infect. Uh, nonetheless, it is true that the ones who seem to be most affected in terms of comorbidities are, in fact, older men. It is older men who have fallen prey to this pandemic more than any other group. Um, so, in and of itself, you could say, in and of itself, this particular pandemic is not necessarily making the most vulnerable. That is to say, women and children are not necessarily the most vulnerable to the severity, to the fatality of this particular pandemic. Uh, but that, I think, only heightens what I think many of us are going to be discussing with all of you today, which, and, which is to say, in spite of the fact that it may not be targeting the very young, in spite of the fact that it may not be overtly targeting women, the disproportionate effects have indeed been very, very different. Um, and so to begin with, and this is, I think, an unfortunate aspect which we must put on the table right away, the, we are not just living in the pandemic, we are also living in the efforts on the part of our governments, well-intentioned efforts, no doubt, to deal with the pandemic. And our government chose to, in, in, to put in place in the end of March, it chose to put in place a, a lockdown, what has been called a lockdown. Commentators tell us that, in fact, India decided to put in the most severe lockdown of any country in the world. In some cities, it was a lockdown that was announced with barely three hours of notice. So some commentators have, in fact, said this is not so much a lockdown, it's a curfew, right? It's an emergency curfew. It should be called a curfew. And it is something that is more associated with a law and order problem than with a health problem. And the reason I'm putting this on the table is that the impacts that we are looking at, many of the impacts that we're looking at are as much a consequence of the ways in which the lockdown was implemented as with the ways in which we have to deal with a pandemic of this nature. So what we are dealing with cannot necessarily be disentangled from the nature of that lockdown. And those of you who are, I mean, going to be speaking about the uh, nature of the migration uh, crisis that emerged, that cannot be put down to the pandemic alone. That has to be also put down to the way in which the state decided to respond. So that's the first uh, point I want to make. The second point is that it's very curious um, that it sometimes takes a moment of this sort where the whole world is brought to a standstill by a pandemic, never before has this happened. It has the strange effect of, and I think it was uh, Ar Arundhati Roy who said, it has the effect of being like an X-ray. It turns an X-ray on society. And you all know what X-rays are. X-rays reveal what is otherwise hidden. That is the bone structure of the body is revealed which otherwise is not available to us. And she called it an X-ray of Indian society, whereby she meant that the class structures that otherwise are hidden from view when we are carrying out our everyday lives, it's not that we are unaware of the differences amongst us. It's not as though we are not aware of rich and poor, but we carry on with our lives. And hence we allow these things to sort of bypass us. Whereas having been quote unquote locked down, having been brought to a standstill and seeing literally unfold in front of us the disastrous consequences of the pandemic and the lockdown, it was as though the class structure of our society was suddenly revealed like an X-ray, like the bone structure of the body. We suddenly saw those who were safe, so, so to say, those who are on the streets with nowhere to go. People who were you know, working in our homes, people who were hawking on the streets, whose livelihoods might have been more or less you know, precarious, suddenly they were with nothing. And suddenly they decided that the home they could only go to was the place to go to. So something was revealed and it was a shock. I, I, I think nobody will forget those images that were brought to us, thanks to journalists, of all these people, mainly men, some women, some children, trudging hundreds of miles. And I'm sure many, many of them were bound to the state of Orissa. Orissa is one of the states with a very high rate of out-migration. Many 
people from Orissa are serving the rest of India in so many different ways. Um, so we were treated to something and we were shocked. We, I mean, middle class was shocked by this image we had suddenly of an underclass, a working underclass, whom this pandemic and lockdown, lockdown had rendered with nothing, homeless, with nowhere to go. However, like any image, like an X-ray image, the image of an X-ray is a very partial one because, you know, X-rays decide to show up the bone structure, but they don't show up other things inside our bodies. So similarly, and I think this will be very much a subject in today's dis discussions, there are other aspects of the fault lines of our society, the inequalities of our society, the, 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 the hierarchies of society that, in fact, were not very visible even at this moment. So aspects of class were visible, but not gender necessarily, not caste, not community differences, not disability, not a whole range of structures that are equally central to the inequalities of our society. Those were not rendered immediately visible in this aftermath of the lockdown. And that is why I think it's such a good decision on the part of all of, 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 of Ram Shaw to decide to focus on gender more specifically and to place gender then within this larger context of class and other forms of inequality and so on. So in the time available to me, I thought I would say something more than about gender itself. If we want to talk about an impact, if we want to dis uh, discuss here what the lockdown and the pandemic have done or are doing, or we think they may be doing to gender relations in our country, then we need to have some idea of what gender relationships have been like before the lockdown. If we don't have a picture of the before, then how do we have the picture of the after? And so I thought I'd just mention on three broad fronts, some elements of what, gen what we in the women's movement and as feminists and as scholars, what we, have been, what we had been talking about prior to the, when we had no clue that a pandemic was going to hit us. And there are three things that have been, for instance, were, have been part of my own concerns. The first is that of violence, harassment, and so on, which have been very much on our agenda ever since, oh, since the beginning of the women's movement, since the Mathura rape case, since the dowry deaths of the late 1970s. But I think the question of violence took on a new charge and became very much more a public dis matter of discussion after the Delhi gang rape of 2012. We saw much more uh, uh, understanding, much more discussion, much more campaigning to end violence against women post 2012, post December 16, 2012. And for me, it was something of an eye opener because I had not been as centrally involved in campaigns against violence and I had not done any research on violence before 2012. So for me, what was an eye opener when I looked at data sets as a researcher, I looked at the National Crimes Records Bureau data sets. And what was shocking to me was to discover, first of all, that rape is not the biggest crime in our record books. The biggest by far in terms of numbers is that are the crimes that come under 498A, cruelty by family members to the woman. By far the largest crimes are performed by family members on women. That's the point number one. Point number two is that even though I, I, I salute Jyoti Singh and her courage and all that her rape enabled, her kind of rape is actually the rarest of the rare rapes. We are all socialized to think that the stranger, somebody lurking after nightfall behind the bushes, that this is the greatest danger to a woman. We are all told never to speak to somebody we don't know. We're all told to come home early. In fact, hostels after the rape case close their gates even earlier than they had before as a response to the Delhi gang rape. However, if we look at the data, if we look at police records, FIRs that are now in part of the NCRB, and I would encourage all of you to please look at this data. What was a shocker to me was that in 2013, the year after the rape, when I looked at this data, as much as 98% of all rapes are rapes known to the victim. A bare 2% of rapes that come to our police stations. And we're talking, by the way, of reported rapes. We're not talking about all the rapes in our, in, in, in that take place about which we don't know. We're talking about reported rapes 
of those, barely 2% are of the kind of the Jyoti Singh, an unknown person to the victim. Everybody else is known in whatever shape or form, whether it be broadly within the kin group, whether it be a neighbor, whether it be a friend, whether it be your boss, whether it be a professor in your university, these are all known to you. People you love and trust are the greater causes of harm than the so-called unknown person. This for me was a big shock. I, I have to say I learned a great deal. So we, I'm, I'm putting this on the table so that we ask ourselves, this is the situation before the pandemic. This is the situation before the lockdown. What do we think will be the situation after? Why do we think that now that families and women are at home, now that women and girls are at home, they should be safe? When in fact, homes have never been the safest spaces for women ever, right? So I would invite you know other speakers to, to dwell on this a little further. Secondly, one of the plus points, one of the few areas where in India we can think that things have been getting better is in the area of education. The gaps, the so-called gender gap in education has been steadily narrowing. Even though we have still, you know, in spite of a Right to Education Act and so on, we still have significant levels of dropouts starting at the primary level and, of course, much more at the secondary le level. Mm -hmm. The point here is that the that these dropouts are roughly not very different when it comes to boys and girls. Boys are dropping out, girls are dropping out. Boys may be dropping out for different reasons, girls may be dropping out for different reasons, mostly having to do, unfortunately, with the way the education system is failing them in one way or the other, and the way in which families are not able to see a future for their sons and daughters. In higher education, I'm now looking at the All India Survey of Higher Education data, which tells us something about the enormous range of all those. This is this is data that actually covers all the universities or, and so on and colleges and other technical institutes of, the, of, of our country. We have a very, very large system. It's the second largest in the world today. We have 26% of a cross enrollment ratio when it comes to girls and boys in the 18 to 23 year age group. And it might surprise everyone to know that as of 2019, girls have actually slightly, in, you know, it's 26.8 or something when it comes to girls, it's 26.7 when it comes to boys. I'm talking about the gross enrollment ratio, the proportion of those in this 18 to 23 year age who are enrolled in some higher education institution. No doubt there are differences. No doubt there are more boys in professional degrees. No doubt there are many, many more in B. Ed colleges and so on. But even on your standard undergraduate college, um, and I don't know what Ravenshaw's uh, data would be like, it would be very interesting to know. In many undergraduate institutions, in fact, there is parity. In the Delhi University where I live today, there are more girls than boys in Delhi University. Delhi University has about two lakh students. OK, so this is a remarkable achievement. Young families want their girls and boys to get as much education as possible. The question in our minds must be now what? What will happen now post pandemic, post lockdown? When everybody's back at home, when the schools are closed, when the colleges are closed, when everything is supposed to go online. What will happen now? Will the parity continue? Or will we see new kinds of differences? If there is only one phone in the home and there are boys and girls both in need of it, who is going to get access to that phone? Right? We have to think here very, very carefully. I don't know what Raven Shaw's plans are for the coming academic year, but all universities are in turmoil over how to move forward. Most of them are deciding to go online. But have we thought through the repercussions of going online when in fact there are going to be huge differences, class differences, rural urban differences, but probably also gender differences. Are we going to see the advantages of having sent girls to school, of girls wanting to go to college? Are we going to see a rollback on those advantages? So that's my second question. My third is in the realm of work, and I'm sure there will be speakers who will say a great deal more about work. We realized long before the pandemic struck, that we are amongst the lowest work participation. When it comes to women, we have the lowest work participation rates for women in the world. 
Only West Asian countries like Saudi Arabia have worse data than we do. All right. So in a in a context in India where work itself is a major major source, it, it's probably the single biggest source of inequality in our country. Barely ten percent of men enjoy regular work with a decent wage. The remaining ninety percent are in various kinds of informal work with irregular sources, casual work, self-employed work, and so on, eking out an existence. This is the story for men. But when we come to women, the story is even worse. Barely five percent of the tiny proportion of women who get any kind of paid work. Only fifteen percent of women in our country who are women are working. Women are working from early morning till late at night. More women work than men do, but in terms of pay, in terms of paid work, a tiny proportion of women receive some kind of pay, whether in the form of a wage, whether in form of some kind of a, a you know self-employed kind of return. Only fifteen percent, one five percent, receive anything. And worst of all, the most shocking of all, these figures have been getting worse in the last decades. We are in the surprising situation. No other country has this situation. of having globalized of having enlarged our economic uh you know uh strength of having expanded in so many ways but in that very context our employment rates for women have actually been declining and the degree of decline has been sharpening so the most recent data and i'm sure uh, ishita and others will speak on this the most recent data are showing not just gradual declines but absolute contractions there has been an absolute contraction looking at the 2017-18 plfs survey an absolute contraction in the total number of women workers this is unprecedented and we are talking 2017-18 so losses have been part of the indian story from before the greatest losses have been in rural areas amongst the less educated small proportions of the better educated in urban india small i'm repeating small enjoy some measure of e economic security uh in say in in better off jobs but even in urban india the largest proportion of women workers are primary school teachers and paid domestic workers these are the two largest categories of work then you have some construction workers then you have people in media and finance and the and the bpos and so on are small 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 proportions so i think the question that can be posed and will be discussed by 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 other speakers is what then will happen if this is the story before the lockdown before the pandemic struck what do we imagine is going to happen after so i now turn over my thoughts uh, to others i hope you will pick up some of these concerns and so that we can think collectively and be as prepared as possible for what we will have to deal with what challenges are unfolding in front of us and what we must do to prevent the worst kinds of gender disparities and disasters from befalling us thank you very much uh, uh yes madam the uh, impact varies from uh, case to case there is class difference there is caste difference there is gender difference and yes you rightly observed that the situation we are experiencing now is more than that of a curfew than a mere health crisis thank you madam um, now i invite uh, our next resource person professor ishita mukhopadhyay to deliver her her webinar lecture thank you madam uh, ishita madam Yeah, 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 madam. We can hear you. We can see you. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, I can't hear anything. That's the problem. I think uh, at my end in this there is the network problem. But I checked all networks anyway. Uh, shall I begin? So I I didn't hear your announcement. I only saw Mary's lips when. <laughs> That's it. The right. 
uh, and I can't even see a shame poor connection. So uh, let me begin by uh, acknowledging the fact that uh, if you take COVID-19, try to take the situation with pre-COVID-19 situation, what was there pre-COVID-19, and I will be discussing only with respect to women's work. Because work, I think, has uh, labor and work, I think, would be a reflection of all kinds of uh, effects, all kinds of dimensions that could put in. So if we talk about uh, labor, then pre-COVID-19 situation, the official records, official statistics that were registering a record fall in India's employment and India's female employment was already going down and it was already in the, uh, in the downward trend and it was already falling. So the female employment, even within the formal sector, it was already falling. But what we saw in the COVID-19, the vulnerability has increased, no doubt. But India's COVID-19 scenario will be remembered and recorded in history by the historical march of the migrants to their homelands. If you look at the victory, this imagery will be recorded imagery in the documentation of COVID scenario in India. This has become historical uh, documentation that they had to walk to their homeland across the rail tracks and they were run over by train sanitizer was, was sprayed upon them and the the imagery that rotis were there on the uh, on the train tracks this is has has been hitting us and women had to deliver their babies on the road who were these women they have been uh, portrayed in the media and in many places as wives of the migrant workers. But they, they are themselves workers. They are the women migrant workers. And although migration was recognized from 2011 onwards, that women migration, there is a significant amount of migrant labor among the labor force, among the laboring class, but women migrants who were the last to migrate out, this migration is significant. This has increased to a large extent in the last decade. This was invisible. And why we say invisible? Invisible in the official statistics. Now, invisible in the official statistics in the sense that many of them were recorded as circular migration. That is, those who return back to their villages. But as we can see, that they became visible with COVID-19. This was in March after, after this lockdown was announced within four days four hours, sorry, not four days, four hours. This four hours lockdown has been kept them walking down their homelands. Some interviews have come up. And one of the interviews, I would just refer to one of the interviews, is that the women were telling that we, when we went out for work, we expected that there is uncertainty, there is risk, something bad might happen, but this is the worst that has happened to us. When we were coming back, all kinds of abuse, the sexual abuse, 
physical abuse and humiliation. So what else is bad for us? We are now, we are now prepared for anything, anything uh, bad or worse. So this is a phenomena which is to be recorded. Now what is happening now? This was in March, April, but what has happened now? Just when we were having this webinar, we were talking about it. Was a, we talked about reverse migration that is coming back to their homeland. Women also came back to their homeland in the villages. And what is happening now? They are going back. In many cases, women are not going back. So what are we going to see when the 2021 census will be coming? We find we will be recording, ironically, in created households with the COVID. Why? Because it is risky, an uncertain world. So men are migrating. So they are starting the whole process of migration in a, in a new way. So they were, they are going back, but women are not going now. Now, what are these women doing? What, 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 what did they expect to do? They will be expecting to do agricultural work. So there will be female headed households again and recorded. They will be recording how we expect. Uh, uh, the expectation is that. What we can expect is that an increase in the supply, increase in the migration to the rural to urban migration within the same state, urban migra urban, a, a kind of circular migration within a day. That is, they come to the city for a day, do the work and then go back to the village because they simply don't work in the village. What would happen? What has COVID-19 led us to? What kind of life, what kind of vulnerability this has led into? This will be looking into women as pushed down, out of the work, but the social reproduction of labor will be going on because there will be more and more uh, workload for them in home-based work, workers in the non-farm sector, rural non-farm sector, RNFS, is their work? No. But they will be doing, they will be putting in labor in expectation of return. So they will, they will try to put in those labor. And there has been a recorded increase in suicides. In Increase in violence, increase in violence in public places for women. So, will the women react? How will this happen? How will this reaction goes? This none of these will be has been most of these has, has not been recorded. They didn't go to police stations. They didn't go to the uh, to, to for a diary. They didn't go. One is that there was a lockdown. They couldn't. Go. They couldn't go to the uh, to their homes, to the safety homes, or to the to the organizations who could help them. But the other part, the other alarming part is that they were deprived from minimum standards of living, mini, the minimum quality of life, which is ensuring them a decent livelihood. They are already living indecently. They have already undergone the... So recalling the incident in Tamil Nadu village of Kamla, the Adivasi girl, Adivasi woman who hanged her daughter, young daughter, and then hand herself, killed her young daughter and then hand herself because there was no work, there was no livelihood and they went without food. Starvation is being leading them to all kinds of work. Even women 
who were on contractual work in the formal sector were laid off. So they are being pushed down to work in the urban organized sector. Look at all the vendors who are coming to of extent, severe extent of job lostness and severe extent of uh, uh, what we can say a pauperization of the female labor force, a total pauperization of the female labor force, including those who have been laid off due to vulnerability. Now, the other factor is this. Yes, uh, 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 am I audible? Yeah. Uh, yes, madam, yes. Yes, so uh, I can't see myself, that's it. Uh, yeah. So the, the other part of the whole episode is that there is a profession where there is a female stereotyping, that is the domestic workers. Do, there are many areas where there are female stereotyping, that is they were working, the domestic workers. So what has happened to domestic workers? If you look at the way in which the pandemic is being counteracted, one of the ways in which it is counteracted is having, a, uh, is having an inherent class bias into it. What is the class bias? That is the the poor people, the vulnerable people, the, the people who have been out of jobs, they are carriers of COVID. So they are say, spreaders, super spreaders, and they will be spreading the disease. So keep them out of the job market. So domestic workers in the first place were kept out. And when the domestic workers were kept out, we had our prime minister also telling that pay them their first uh, month's salary, but only it stopped there. The state only stopped there. So what has happened? There have been evidences of several surveys which have been done in many of the cities that 70 to 80 percent, roughly 70 to 80 percent, if I recall all of the surveys, have lost their job because it was only for the first month they were paid they were not paid, they were laid off. And due to lack of minimum wages being passed, not being, not being passed, due to lack of proper standard of living and proper wages, what we find is that they had to, they, some of them are working in two, three homes, in many homes to make their both ends meet. But now they are being told that if you go to other other places, other houses, so you cannot come here, but they are not protected. They are, the, the, their wages are not protected also. So they lost their jobs. So domestic workers are losing their jobs. They have Most of them have lost their jobs. It is a predominantly female occupation. The essential workers were there. Now, who are the essential workers? The healthcare workers. So, five karmacharis are one of the essential workers, and many of them are women. They have been without protective gear throughout. They have been working throughout and falling victim to the diseases. If you talk in, even in the healthcare workers, the ASHA workers are on a nationwide strike. The ASHA workers are on a nationwide strike. They are frontline warriors in COVID warriors. They are taking their healthcare workers, but they have been deprived of minimum security in terms of social security as well as the health security. So the ASHA care workers, the ASHA workers, and also the other workers, 
who are in the healthcare system but who are not factual workers, who are working as casual workers on peace rated basis like the ayahs, like many uh, caregivers who are working, what protective gear are they getting not? And we had the incidents in Bengal, one of these healthcare workers tried to commit suicide even within the hospital, not being able to go home for days has a child and not being given the protective gear in the COVID cases. So, so they, she tried to commit suicide, but she was prevented. And when these workers, these women workers are coming home, are facing the social stigma. So the, the, the women who are, women are losing jobs. This is one kind of a story. Women are not getting jobs. This is one kind of a story. They were already on the down, uh, down line with the jobs, but they are now losing jobs. The second is the fact that those who are working also, the, the, most of the healthcare workers are women. Apart from doctors and nurses, there are many others, healthcare workers, who are on the vulnerable side. Particularly the ASHA workers and the contractual workers. Uh, ayas, the Safai Karmacharis. So those who are working here, even in, in essential services, they are deprived from minimum wages on A, deprived from their health security grounds also, and many of them are, in, are falling victims to COVID. Many of them are falling victims to COVID, losing their lives, so you see a clear class across gender occurring here. Many are talking about the unpaid care work, which has decreased for the women. So it is not being recognized at all. It was never recognized. Now the unpaid care work for the women has increased. It has increased. So the invisibility of women's work is increased. The under visibility of women's work is also increasing, even in the places where they are working. So are we regressing backwards as far as the employment livelihood is concerned? Now, if we talk about the way in which we are trying to pull up our GDP with respect to work, with respect to employment, is again looking at as after pronouns, as far as the Make in India programs are there, they, we want to make them after pronouns. But what have we given these women? So without looking at this, uh, without giving them the minimum living standards and minimum uh, uh, a minimum wages. How can we ask these women to be spearheading the economic progress of the country? It's, it's absurd. The last point that I would like to make in this respect with respect to COVID, what has COVID exposed? COVID has exposed what was already there. Violence in the workplaces was already there. Women's work was already falling. It, it was exas exaggerated. What are the new uh, effects of COVID? Which we will see is that the glorification of women's household work is being there. That women are taking care of the lives with the women. A glow of care work is being is being there is being there. And a glorification of women's role in the private spaces is being there. So how can women be in the private spaces? You can safe at home. Even if you work from home, 
you are glorifying the domestic work so what are the domestic works that the tendency of moving towards home based work tendency of moving towards again a social reproduction system where you are not giving the women workers any tools any uh, means of production you are asking her to provide everything so what is happening in essence it has already started women are becoming severely indebted if you get if you give loans to women then it will be in the name of entrepreneurship so it is easy for the family the devastated families to take loans in the name of women so they, they we are in effect having a large lot indebted women workers indebtedness is increasing so this was never there with respect to the earlier epidemic situation in fact indebtedness in effect was not visualized even when in the last in the in the the re, much referred spanish flu epidemic so here indebtedness is becoming only one of the way out to keep livelihood to keep uh, in their work and so that it's a, again it's a perception that women will be able to uh, remain in workplaces so indebtedness is increasing and if you try to look into this indebtedness this is going side by side with increased starvation indebtedness in, uh, going side by side with a, a myopic vision that they will be able to create a market for their products which is not there market for no product is there how will market for her products be there so as it is scenario is not only it's it's go above the feminization and defeminization it's a we are moving towards a more bondage with respect to women laborer i left a I left apart the part of the Ek us sunai nahi pad rahe yahan to to arts to arts so indebtedness is a new part of this pandemic and I end and I have an you know not so uh, with this I end and I thank you again allowing me to share some of my thoughts thank you um uh, thank you madam uh you really focused on the very uh, uh, pertinent issues impinging on our everyday existence during pandemic covid-19 yes covid-19 has altered our discourse of migration toxic turfily we are uh, now forced to rethink what migration means and yes you rightly observed there is an increase in domestic violence both um, Uh, inside home and violence uh, in the public sphere. You dwelt upon a wide range of issues impinging our everyday existence. Thank you, madam. Um, now we request the the next speaker in our panel is uh, uh, the founder director of the Women's Studies uh, Utkal University, uh, Professor Asa Hans. Asa, madam. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. and uh, thank you for inviting me and it's good to see uh friends uh, on the screen after so long some of you uh then i think maybe some uh, uh, sound might be put off then you know it will be clearer some of the microphones if you put them off it might be clearer not Uh, i just wanted to begin with since it's a women studies meeting uh, by revensha that uh, migration studies and women studies have been there for a long time but women studies of course has proliferated a lot i have worked with uh, migration studies also for a number of years and uh, i think it's time now to intersect them 
I will be talking on migration and women mostly uh, in what has happened just before and after pandemic. And uh, both Mary and Ishita have sent the uh, ground for me to begin this discussion. Mm, a lot of things have been uh, said about it, which I might repeat, uh, but a little bit more in depth. The first thing that why are women invisible? Uh, a lot of uh, both the speakers talked about it, that there is an invisibility and Ashima also. I think there is an invisibility. The first thing is there is because of the data. If data that has come, we get it from the census and we get it from the NSSO. Now, the census data says that about, I think it's a little less than 70 percent, uh, should be around 65.5 or percent or something. That That is the women who migrate. Now, if they migrate, and what Ishita said, and that there are the visibility is poorer, why is it that um, we don't see women? The reason given is that in the data, women migration is shown for marriage, that women who marry migrate because they go to their husband's house or they migrate. Now, the funny thing is that they do not take into account that women, when they migrate, also do work wherever they go. So, you know, they see one side of the pattern. They don't see the whole thing. They show you only half a picture because the census asks only one question. Uh, where did you come from? Uh, they say, I came from, uh, suppose, from Calcutta. Then that means you have migrated. Why have you migrated? I migrated for marriage. So, you know, it does not take into account that women who marry also do work. And that work is not accounted for in the data. The NSSO data, of course, is also gives certain problems also. So what it leaves us with is what uh, is called as unaccounted women. In our databases, in our studies, what we see is a large number of women who are not there. They are invisible because they are not they are unaccounted. Besides marriage is also the first study that I did in migration was on uh, Mm, the migration of women in uh, Odisha and Balangir and Wapara, where you had family migration. And these are circulatory migration, which is for a short term season. So when short term season and family migration take place, usually women are less accounted for, even though they are working. They are less paid also in family wages that, that are given because wages are not given per individual. Wages are given per family. And usually the when the contractors uh, come to you, they tell you, OK, we will give you so much and this much for the woman. So the woman gets much less than what they are. When you go out to work, there is no portage of your social security system. Now the government has announced that the PDS will be given. But till now, there has been no PDS, no social security, no help. You cannot carry anything with you. So that means it makes you more vulnerable. Women, especially in the health sector, are much more vulnerable. There is also a very great gender bias that you will see in, in um, migration, where women are concerned. Their jobs are not usually decided by them. It is decided either by because you are going in a family, so you go to the brickens, or because women are supposed to do particular kind of jobs. They do stitching, so, um, embroidery. So when they go for training, and then they are asked to join the garment trade. So this that is there has become a very big. There are two kinds of uh, jobs that are in uh, that you see women in. One is working in the brickens, but also a lot of them are going as garment workers. And this is linked to the government program on skill building. Now, where skill building is concerned, the women are usually very, very young. And uh, the kind of work that they do is usually very stereotyped. So you have a stereotype and a gender bias right from the beginning that this is the kind of job you will do. And this is the kind of salary attached to it. Young women who went uh, for a study that I did for ILO on garment manufacturers so that young women are asked to join the garment industry, but not the computer one. And the computers were getting much more higher paid, both in the report and in the Now, this was the kind of uh, background that you can see. 
there is also one part of migration which very few people talk about and that is the women headed household where remittances come if remittances do not come as they are not coming now it leaves a lot of women out of the workforce out of the the visibility that we have that and that we are getting that does not mean that they do not give uh, um, due work is not done by them ishita will be able to tell us that there is so much of rural economy that is uh, that women Okay. Now, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, but yes. Nineteen. Uh, if with that kind of background that you have, where migration is concerned, and women's uh, uh, standards and conditions and quality of life are concerned, you will see that there is a little distinct change that we come to uh, to um, uh, to COVID nineteen. I was asked by uh, NDMA to do a guideline for them. and i found that uh, for on disaster risk reduction the same when we uh, it came to covid 19 did not work at all that means that there has been a, a, a tremendous change in meeting the kind and the pandemic that is there now where male urban is concerned there has been a lot of increase in the male where urban to urban is concerned that is why when uh, ishita was talking about visualization and where other visualizations are concerned women are fewer there because there has been you usually saw very young men small very young men and most of them were urban workers who had come from uh, doing uh, jobs in some company or some industry the young women were missing most of the young women either stayed back to come together they did not take the long walk home on the long marches home the women who came were mostly they were um, in the study that we did uh, recently were basically they were either working with families or they had been there for in a chain agreement for a long long time now and so they had those head loads that you could see and that they were walking now where uh, one of you mentioned also violence violence is not is part of our life of as women but in covid 19 there was a new kind of violence that was seen this violence was not only where they started it was on the road in the accommodation that women found in the hotels where they stayed in the dhabas where they ate on the streets that they walked there was violence across um, uh, the whole walk that they came from the sending area to the receive, from the receiving area to the sending area they also had violence faced in many or many of the quarantine centers and in check case for the first time india has now borders between states so these borders have check posts and at every check post there is always a violence women that could be seen now there were no one stop centers to report to there were no uh, protection officers for a long time we have been telling the government that please make uh, where protection uh, officers are concerned tell them to to make it um, 
uh, that they are independent and not uh, the CDPOs, etc. in many of the states who are there. So when they were there, the CDPOs were busy. There were no, uh, no one to report to. They, they could not walk, as uh, someone said, about the FIRs that were launched. Where the economy was concerned, uh, though for uh, both uh, uh, Mary and the Ishita have talked about the loss of jobs uh, and a tremendous loss of jobs that was there. There is another thing attached to it, Ishita. When you talked about assets, uh, there is uh, women who have been um, selling off their assets. What are the assets that women have? Usually it is a little money, but it is also the gold that your mother gives you or you might have bought. So a lot of gold is being uploaded onto the market by women because they do not have the money to come home or when they came home, they do not have jobs. So they needed money to eat. So beside uh, the assets that they are losing, there's also a lot a beginning of selling of land. Land alienation has already started in large way in uh, what some of the studies that we did in um, two or three states recently. So that leaves women open. If you are assetless, it leaves you open to exploitation. There is also low nutrition. So if you have low nutrition and you have a workplace and you have no uh, access to food, or if there is uh, what some reports mention, only 60% women had access to food. Uh, sorry, 60% did not have access to food. Then it becomes a critical issue because this is the season when uh, your agriculture is starting. So if you are malnutrition and you do not have, uh, <coughs> you are not healthy enough to go into the farmlands to work, naturally then nutrition plays a large part in your lives. So this is another thing. The other thing that has come in many of the states, in mine, of course, in Chhattisgarh, we have seen, in Jharkhand, we have seen that malaria eradication programs have stopped. So in all those state and districts where there is rampant malaria and there is no program in place, there is no immunization of children, the health we are face, going to face now, what is called a health pet and disaster, complete disaster after this, beside the economic disaster. Now, the social security that is supposed to help you uh, was offered to domestic workers. They were given 500 rupees as social security. What do you get with 500 rupees? Not even an LPG cylinder can come for 500 rupees. So this, and um, if you talk about free cylinders, maybe one or two a year that is given, and that had also stopped, and one of the reasons why the Jharkhand elections were fought on LPG cylinders. So these are things that have carried on and is also something that is still uh, happening. So in that, under those conditions, you know, what do we do? We have no law on migration. The migration law that is there, one law that is there, the Migrant Workers Act, does not include women. So where women are concerned, we don't have a legal framework for law. So that is the first thing, and that is something that uh, will, ha will have to be looked into. They have spent so much on health that health expenditure has ruined many of them because when they came into quarantine centers with uh, positive uh, core and they went home, uh, the, con the, the expenditures still continued. Social security is not there for all of them. There is also domestic violence is excluded, but there is one hope which was there. I don't know if the government will even look at it. And that is the Forest Right Act, which said that where land was concerned, it could be redistributed to marginalized people especially where uh, tribal women are concerned, if the Adivasis are concerned. So, you know, we have to take those on board. Some of the issues that have been um, not looked into for a long time. And if you see men going back to work, they have already the march back has started and women not going back. The workload increases, uh, the expenses are uh, increased. They don't have remittances. So that means they have to carry the village economy on their shoulders. 
it is because men are leaving. Now, these are the kind of issues I think that are there in migration. I leave you with this. It is a depressing situation, but I think we can uh, together uh, fight this kind of situation, mm -hmm. not alone, but maybe with solidarity with each other. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam, as you rightly pointed out. Uh, violence constitutes an integral component of women's lives and violence is omnipresent. It is there in uh, bus, inside train, inside police station, in dhabas, in schools, uh, in educational institutions. Even quarantine centers have been no exceptions. Thank you, madam. Now, ex uh, now we request uh, Professor Bibhuti Patari, a practicing gender expert in Tata Institute of, Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, to deliver her webinar lecture. Thank you very much. I superannuated from Tata Institute after completing 65 years on, in June, on June, but still I am associated in so far as the MPhil and PhD program is concerned. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Ashima Sahu uh, and uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Ishan Kumar Patru for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, and uh, I also greet Professor Ishita Mukhopadhyay, Professor Asha Hans, Dr. Mary John, uh, Dr. Vikram Prishra, and Kumar Patro, all the participants, students, and teachers. Uh, it is uh, after very in depth presentations examining different dimensions of gender impact on uh, of coronavirus uh, on the Indian society, Indian economy. I think I would like to uh, highlight some of the issues uh, and I would compliment what the uh, 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 my previous three speakers have said and uh, also, luckily all of us are on the same wavelength so far as the sensitivity and sensibility is concerned so it makes it easier first uh, issue that i would like to take up is that uh, uh, working from home the kind of stress which has in increased because everybody in the family whether they have a business or they are unemployed or they are working from home has made massive or like a multiple task uh, for women has become a norm and it's more uh, intensified. There are multiple demands on women and the adolescent girls in the family, whether they are in college or school, there is a lot of surveillance happening. In fact, most of, most of the panic calls I have received as a, a, a volunteer for the, for the violence issue uh, is are from the uh, adolescent girls. This, the, the, everybody checks, becomes a custodian of their morality with whom they talk and their mobiles are checked and a lot of uh, psychological, emotional violence they are facing. And the multiple demands of self-care because you can't afford to get sick because if you fa fall sick, who will look after the other family members? Adult care, child care and elderly care because so many elderly people who were staying uh, uh, alone earlier uh, in course of lockdown, they have moved back to their own family, my extended family, because they are not getting any support uh, because the earlier the support they had of uh, domestic help, that is also gone. So uh, first time, like we are discussing very seriously the care economy and the care work, whether it is a paid care work or unpaid care work is being uh, uh, discussed. Another thing that working from home has also brought in the issue of uh, online uh, sexual harassment, the, the kind of presentations people are making online and now a lot of complaints have uh, emerged. Uh, the most excluded people in these uh, communities in this lockdown have been the women-headed households, as my previous speakers also said, single women, women, divorced women, women uh, who are uh, separated, who are facing long-term male migration, and also uh, widow uh, women, uh, women with uh, persons, people with disability, lonely elderly. Uh, in fact, there have been a couple of studies done by how the elderly people are coping up in today's in fact in so many places in mumbai and on when elderly people have any ailment no hospital is ready to and uh, ready to even give them any services saying that in any case you are going to die such a cynical attitude uh, of the hospitals and nursing homes even in in, in city like mumbai even when they are ready to pay nobody is ready to offer them medical services a transgender community the relief operations which my, my many of my friends are involved in they said that even the most prestigious philanthropic institutions who are known to have given, say, one lakh food packets a day or 50,000 food packets, they are refusing any kind of support to two communities, transgender community 
and also uh, the sex workers. And we have seen so many cases of suicides by them. And it is only the uh, uh, women's rights organization, feminist groups, and uh, uh, social work institutions who are reaching out to them. Uh, prisoners, the kind of 33 percent prisoners in uh, big jails like Yarwada and Arthur Road, they have been COVID positive and they are completely neglected. And even those who are in the shelter home, whether they are children's shelter home, uh, shelter homes in tribal area, and shelter homes for women survivors of violence, we see that uh, that they are overcrowded and they are there. No kind of services are offered. At the same time, when there are hospitals like One Stop Crisis Center, where they have allocated special ward now after a lot of human cry by the women's organization during the month of march and april uh, the beds are empty because the, the the gatekeepers in the hospital would not allow these women survivor of violence without any covid tests so there are services and there are that they, they, they are not being accessed uh, and uh, they have not been accessible and uh, other ways like we see majorly there are no absence of such services Another very important concern that we have about the children, the children's helpline. Like earlier, we used to see street children on the railway platforms, at the bus, at the, in the public places, on the footpath. Now these street children are not to be seen. What happened to them? Slowly and gradually, we are getting uh, reports. First of all, the distress call to the child helpline have increased 10 times more. So that is there. Trafficking of women and children, there have been many cases of where, where it is reported. Now, in the unlock period, a lot of testimonies are coming out. Forced marriages have increased mainly because of the economic distress, because even women workers, because the definition of labor workforce in India is 15 to 59. So, so many girls who were in the age group of 15 to 18 who were working in the urban centers, they have gone back. And after reverse migration, they, they are forced into marriage and uh, uh, for, for money. So, this thing and the whole phenomenon of boys locker room which we saw that so many whatsapp groups have emerged which are uh, talking which are which are valorizing the culture of rape and the toxic masculinity militant masculinity and very very aggressive masculinity has been uh, coming out through the uh, 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 whatsapp groups so whatever was uh, as as in the very beginning Professor Shima Shao said that whatever inequalities were existing in the society, they have exponentially uh, multiplied, and uh, in the uh, and and the violent culture of violence and culture of uh, rape that has also been valorized uh, again and again using cyber technology and social media. Coming to the question of women in agriculture, Makam has come out with a rapid assessment need uh, rapid need assessment studies. Three reports have come out, and they are saying, and Makam is active in 18 states of India, and they say that uh, at one level we are talking about the future of agriculture is with women, and there is a feminization of agriculture, but in the agrarian sector also there is a massive hunger. There is a need for community kitchen, and MG Narega Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, Abhiyan has allocated. Uh, uh, one lakh crore to MG Narega, 60 lakh, uh, 60,000 crores were given by the budget 2019-2021 and added additional 40,000 crores have been given, but uh, women are getting uh, unequal wages, even the studies by Action Aid and uh, Swan report also shows that uh, women are getting one third or sometimes two third of the wages. If men are getting 320, women are getting uh, 120. Uh, and I think that even Ishta uh, also talked about. Uh, and other thing is that uh, 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 that's why, I, and, and also how to make a creative use of engineering, if it's such a massive program is there, then it should, it should not be treated as a dead end job. And some of the states like Bihar and Jharkhand, they have started doing the need assessment, they have started doing the skill mapping. And according to the skill sets, which this people, because most of the reverse, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the three crore migrant workers who have gone back, so they have multiple skills. They have worked uh, in a, a, a urban sector doing a lot of uh, 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 activities. Many of them are 12th pass and they are, they, they are uh, educated. So I think using their skill for creation of a new infrastructure for which we are talking about that now in the rural and peri-urban areas also, public health sector uh, 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 intervention has to be wide with more and more detection center contagious diseases uh, hospitals and also the shelter homes because even there the those who have migrated back many of them are not even welcome by their extended families 
coming to the forest economy, I think Rosa Hashanj meant that currently we have 11% of the Indian popula or tribal population is in the rural and tribal areas. And their major livelihood comes from the NTFP, non-timber forest product and minor forest product. Around 200 varieties of these products they collect. In the month of March, they had already collection was made. The contribution of this NTFP is 20,000 crores to the Indian economy, and uh, they have suffered a lot. They asked for exemption of GST on these products, but that is not granted. So I think that is a major concern with the tribal organizations have been taking up. Now, coming to the question of reproductive health needs of women, so I think all speakers, they spoke about the stoppage of antenatal care uh, during, in fact, in so many places, the maternity ward was converted into a COVID ward in, in Mumbai public hospitals and civil hospitals, we saw. No tetanus vaccine was given to pregnant women in the seventh month of pregnancy, which is a usual practice. So a lot of reproductive morbidity has also taken place. Women neonatal uh, care has been hampered, like polio vaccine, triple vaccine. They have not been for past four months are not there. And plus, most important is the health statistics. Only seven, 27 percent of the pregnant uh, of the deliveries are reported. And when it comes to registration of children over the last four months, only 17 percent new uh, newly born children have been registered. So all their other support system, which comes from the public health, is going to be uh, affected. And we have seen uh, the frontline healthcare workers, when we talk about, like India has 70% uh, like of the frontline workers who are registered. Uh, that means they are out of 9 lakhs are registered because they are the ones who, get the, who, who are there on the record of the government. Others are on a contract labor. Amongst them, I'm not talking of only doctors and nurses, but also sanitary workers, Anganwadi workers, because ICDS uh, is a very important program. They have played a very important role also over the last uh, four months. ASHA workers, NRHN, yesterday, 5 lakh of them were on strike, as Ishta told. And if we also include government teachers, of the school teachers who are also involved in distribution of PDS, because that's what, whether it is in Delhi or uh, in the rural or uh, uh, urban areas, everywhere, uh, government teachers are uh, are there for the, for the they, they are the ones who are in charge of uh, distribution of PDS. This week. Now, the only one aspect which we we, we, uh, we need, uh, which, which has not been discussed so far, is the question of labor course. Like, uh, we had 48 labor legislations, which the working class movement won as a result of collective effort over the last 150 years. And the talk of abandoning, give, giving up the, and I think 12 states have already given up the labor laws. They are forcing workers to work for 12 hours. We also saw 15 days back, young women in the garment industry in Bangalore went on a strike. There is a lot of witch hunting going on at a shop floor level. There is the uh, Ambikar Institute of Labor Studies has been organizing constant like uh, 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 online training programs during the lockdown period just to retrace the issues which they are facing at a front line after the unlock, which started from 31st of July and nearly 25% uh, industries in MSME sector started working currently, at least Maharashtra claims that 65,000 industrial units are working. But minus any of the protective labor legislations, whether they are about the labor and the four labor codes, which talk about the workload, where also the workload has increased to 12 hours, labor standards are completely given up, occupational health, nobody's bothered. In fact, none of these four labor codes mention women as a worker, number one, and there is nothing about the safety of women, occupational safety they talk about, but there is nothing about women's safety at workplace and also not about the reproductive health, that these are the women who are, uh, what about the, their, their sanitation, menstrual health, that was also not there, and none of the reproductive health issues are even treated as a, a emergency or essential services. Uh, Organizations like Janaswasthya Abhiyan and Medical Friends Circle, Doctors Without Border, globally as well as in India, are demanding that 6% of GDP should be allocated for uh, public health. WHO has suggested that in the current context of coronavirus uh, and the health emergency, 10% of GDP should be allocated for uh, uh, by all the nation states, which currently our country is giving less than 2%. So I think that is also a very important uh, concern that we have. Uh, and the whole patriarchal structure of the healthcare system, where the doctor is treated as a father figure, a nurse is treated as a mother figure without any, her work is valuable, but it has, she has no status of power or recognition or, 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 or any decision-making power. 
and they are the ones who are at the front line. And the patients are treated as infants and children. And I think during this COVID crisis, the kind of horror stories we have heard from the people seeking, whether it's a COVID-related or non-COVID-related health, health behavior. So health women as health seekers, I think they have been completely infantilized. They are neglected and they are invisibilized. And it is in this con uh, the only uh, 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 ray of hope that I see is a people to people solidarity. Because in the uh, response to this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, for last 16 weeks, what we have seen is the women's rights organizations, community-based non-government organizations, uh, networks on the right of right to food and right to shelter, citizens' association, self-help groups, uh, uh, trade unions, organizations like uh, All India Women's Democratic Association and NFIW, they have been providing variety of support right from food shelter water health care sanitary equipments personal protection equipments and in very very valuable vital information because there is so much of arbitrariness under the lockdown that people get brutalized they get they, and the police is using only the logic of lati goli bedi and jail where, where, where there is no no persuasion and democratic uh, complete violation of human rights so much so that that nhrc had to appoint a special committee uh, to to look into the violation of human rights in this thing. So I think that is very important. Women health activists are giving online counseling. They are highlighting uh, reproductive health needs of women. They are supporting frontline health workers. They are providing the sanitary material, uh, especially sanitary pads to the community. And I think this people to people solidarity is a very important historical uh, thing that has happened. And that's why the civil society groups which are extensively using social media because mainstream media is very, very partial about what, and it is this very strong middle class bias. So I think that is a very uh, encouraging news. And the women's movement in India and globally also has uh, highlighted seven impo eight important issues, safety and personal protection equipment for frontline workers, food security, that means we will have to run the community kitchens and countries poorer than us in Africa and Latin America have run are running community kitchens. So I think we need to, because the, the hunger is a major major challenge in both rural and urban areas and water and sanitation become very very important for the community uh, labor helpline exclusively to deal with the issues in the workforce not only about the data on migration who migrated and who are reverse migration it should go beyond that so all the complaints of non-wage payment brutality at the work, work workplace and also the 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 news un, uh, unpaid wages all those issues should be should be covered by the and, and this labor helpline should be in regional languages uh, but there should be exclusive well, well, uh, helpline only for the pregnant women for the reproductive health needs of women and it should be treated as an essential service universal basic income should is a global demand even the economists who were very much sold to the neoliberal logic they have also started talking about the universal basic income uh, the computations are varying like uh, dr mahendra dev igidr and the ex uh, rbi governor they say that it should be 50 4500 rupees uh, feminist groups and the uh, gender experts are talking that it should be 7500 minimum uh, uh, support price that should be given and the last but most important is that uh, respect for human rights protocols, uh, uh, which India is signatory to, because that's a gross violation at the ground level. And I think we have to train our criminal justice system, our governance structures and uh, political bodies about the respect for, I mean, under the cloak of coronavirus and under the, uh, under the garb of COVID uh, emergency, you just can't do away with the human rights. So democratic uh, governance, transparency, well, respect for human rights are as important as fighting against COVID virus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, as you rightly said, yes, there is a surge and increase in uh, the violence against women and the culture of violence. Um, and for the aggravates, what worsened the situation is when uh, it is supported by uh, digital technology and they use social media to uh, 
intensify their activities of violence and your comments on the cynicism with which patients are treated covid 19 patients are treated in hospitals were indeed heart wrenching thank you madam uh, uh, the value of an event uh, increases when um, the final words are uh, given by the leader of the organization yes we have our ultimate mentor motivator with us our esteemed vice chancellor professor ishan kumar patra i humbly request um, our esteemed vice chancellor to deliver his presidential address for this august event sir Namaskar. Namaskar. Uh, Professor Asa Hansi, Professor Vibhuti Patel, Professor Isita Mukhadhyay, Professor Mary John, Professor Asima Sahu, Professor Vikram Kesari Mishra. I see quite a few very senior participants over there, all respected participants. Uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's, it's good to be a vice chancellor, but very difficult to really exist as a vice chancellor. You have to speak anything, everything, anywhere, everywhere. I don't know. I may be trying to make a little justice to the uh, lectures that are given by such le learned people on the subject. Uh, but I've been asked to say something I must say. Uh, all the four uh, dignitaries have really spoken too good about the scenario and it's very alarming not today it's alarming forever that not only india all over the world uh, the human population as such from the day of uh, the conception of idea of living together the men has always been doing all all the things that the women do not like uh, i'm sure i'm pretty sure what what the what has been spoken is correct and i i support all the views that have been given there and i have some observations which are a little uh, little away from what has already been discussed because i am a biologist i am a medical scientist so i would like to see this through a medical uh, perspective uh, what we have come to in in another uh, um, webinar where this gender was also an issue uh, that was uh, organized by history department i spoke a few things that i i will repeat again because most of the uh, uh, participants to this seminar would not have attended that what has happened in uh, covid is uh, we know by now that the men is more affected by covid than the women uh, the reason for that are many but to give you a little bit of uh, sort of uh, semi statistical semi uh, quantitative uh, information the uh, fertility uh, the fatality ratio fatality ratio is death rate the death rate is more in male than the female the city of wuhan where uh, this covid started the very first data came from the, there with the with the gender uh, differentiation is uh, telling us that 2.4 times more of male patients died as compared to the women. But now there has been a correction in that. Earlier they said less number of women came for reporting. But what we are getting now is it's almost equal. Equal number of male and female reported with the infection. But large number of male died. The severity is also are more all over the world. Now the European data and American data also suggest that the male are suffering more when they, they come to this infection than the, than the female. Uh, God has been great and we understand in medical science also that the mechanisms in a woman is more towards repair than in a male. So the repair mechanism is faster and better in a female body than the male body and that we can see and we can see in this data it is happening there. And the innate immunity is also more in the women than in the men. So this is helping. Uh, but what is alarming is the, the WHO in as, as early as 14th May said that uh, 
this pandemic is bringing in a raise in the number of violence against women and children and it is increasing faster in lockdown and uh, the access to sexual and reproductive health and health rights of the women is also getting diminished because we have got limited amount of medical benefits and medical facilities which are being getting accommodated or getting occupied by the pandemic patients leading to a situation where the women are suffering. The point, the point being a day of delivery or day of uh, birth of a child will not differ. The pregnancy period cannot be uh, extended just because there is a uh, pandemic uh, happening there. So what should have been taken care of, which has never been taken care of in all these pandemic issues, is that the maternity homes should not have been at any point of time converted into COVID centers. And this has been done all over the world. So there have been social and uh, uh, health workers who are largely women. And uh, of course, uh, now people have, after a while, people became very uh, careful about that. And we started giving all types of positive uh, protective gears to the women um, and men both. Uh, but the point is that uh, health givers or, or caregivers are more, more of them are women than the men. So the workforce there on the front, in the medical point of view, are the women. So we had, to, we have to be, had, uh, we should have been, we have to be, and we continue to be more careful in that front. I have a paper from Lancet. Lancet, has, uh, if I have to uh, tell the people from social sciences, Lancet is the number one reporting journal for medical sciences. So uh, a paper in Lancet, is, uh, Lancet or Nature, they're all considered to be equal and they, they are very important papers. And then, then they have never been challenged uh, on this earth. So it's a recent paper I have got on my hand, which, which speaks a lot about this uh, women um, harassment part of it and how this pandemic has been uh, uh, more responsible for, uh, for reversing whatever we did in terms of uh, gender equity. What it says, the UN Secretary General uh, said in um, last month, he said that COVID-19 could reverse the limited progress that has been made on gender equality and women rights. That's very alarming. Even human secretary admits this, that becomes a question and that becomes a, an issue that has to be addressed very carefully by all the governments all over the world. Now, what is more uh, important now uh, to think is that, as, as all the four uh, speakers have said, the infection versus uh, infect versus affect. The person who is right comes back home. But what has affected the family or what has affected the po population where the infection has occurred is something that is not quantitated because we are more into saving lives than looking into other part of it. So it is very important now that uh, things are getting settled a bit. And now that uh, the, the kind of infection that we are used to have, the, the, the rigorous of or the, or the severity of the infection and number of deaths we used to have has gone down. Now it is time that we should also start thinking about not only infection, not only the infect part of it, the affect part of, of it should also be uh, considered very carefully. And the affect part of it is actually what is being discussed today. Who is affected most in such pandemic situations? See, in all over the world, more so in India, we consider the male is a earning hand. He is working from home. He's doing a great job, isn't it? He's staying back home and working. He used to go out and work. But now see, he's staying home and working and creating more of trouble, perhaps. But all the jokes we get in the WhatsApp, we always listen to it. It's not working from home. It is. It has become working at home. And working at home is helping the wife. And working, working from home is earning the money. And I do not know how big a challenge it is for the male persons. But it has already become a big challenge for the women race. Why so? Because now we are seeing that uh, it says... Uh, we have about um, four, uh, 740 million women who are working into formal and informal mode of uh, job. More in informal and less informal mode of jobs in 
in the world uh, population. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's 740 million is only informal mode of uh, uh, jobs amongst the women in all over the country, uh, world. Now you multiply it or maybe multiply it several times, which is a formal mode of work that the women force is doing. What is happening now? Lockdown is, now that I have got uh, my <laughs> learned professor, all of them are ladies, excuse me if I am wrong anywhere, but what happens to a lady who is working? She has got a dual, pers dual personality. Till nine in the morning, she is a mother, a wife, and a lady, getting herself ready for the job, which starts after 10 or after nine. But till nine, she does everything, but at 10, she forgets the rest of it. Now she becomes a worker, is equal to a gentleman, comes to the workforce. We may um, go on discussing on it, whether she gets that equity there or not, but to her, she is equal to any other person in the workforce. She comes to the work, stays there till 5.36, 6, 6.37, and back home again to become a mother, a wife, and a lady. What has happened in lockdown is, she does it all through. She is a wife, she is a mother, she is a lady, and a worker also sitting in home. And what is also adding to that is the pressure of not getting out of those troubles or, or what, whatever I may use the word quote unquote troubles of home, staying in home, looking into those troubles alongside the work. This is a very different and difficult scenario. I cannot understand this as a male person, but all the females are suffering this. And what has come to now is the lockdown actually has bogged down all the uh, females and they are really in trouble in understanding where are they? Are they workers or are they, are they officers or managers or executives or they are the same housewife and mother, but they're doing the rest of it again. And what we have come to understand in corporate sector is the workload has really gone up because nobody sees them working. They only command, command a work, not understanding what is going through it. So all the people forgot on this earth to say that a woman working from home should have a little less work as compared to a male working from home. And I would say anybody working from home should have less work as compared to what he was doing working from his workplace. Because workplace is an isolated place. When you're working from home, you've got everything else. Your family, your children, your TV, your telephone, your visitors. Are, of course, visitors are not coming here. But all the noise of home, all the noise of neighborhood, everything is there minus the working environment where he is confined to a working room and doing his job. In addition to that, there are other issues which needs to be uh, considered is that the men in all over the world has been understood to have more of the comorbidities like the rate of uh, higher rates of obesity, hypertension, diabetes and lung diseases are compared to the women. Barring a few countries where the women smoke more than the men, uh, major countries we have found that women have almost stopped smoking. Smoking anyway has gone down all over the world. But it is true that the comorbidities are more in men than in the women. The pandemic actually is uh, deepening the pre-existing inequalities, exposing vulnerabilities of in social, political and economic systems, which are in turn amplifying the impacts of the pandemic as such. So it is not only the, the COVID-19 virus that is causing a, a, a trauma in the, in the mind and existing of human being, but it is also there are also other issues which has now become a part and parcel of the pandemic uh, panic. And this panic is really becoming too difficult now. And it all, almost every country has also come to think about it now that we, we are no more saying it is a lockdown, it is on luck as a psychological treatment for a person. But if you go on saying you are locked down, locked down, you may be bogged down. So he said you have unlocked, unlocked you, but still the lockdown continues. Like uh, Friday evenings in Orissa are traumatic evenings. Because everybody goes out because Saturday and Sunday they cannot go out and do anything else. So I have got serious questions on this. Are we really going to lock down for two days, Saturday and Sunday? Or we are having enough of exposure on Friday evening 
which is good enough to sleep for Saturday and Sunday, not cause any more infections or any more um, contamination during that time. And now UN has also uh, cautioned that a lot of women who have escaped extreme poverty are at risk of falling back because those who were in extreme poverty, they came for informal work and their work has gone now. My daughter in Mumbai said there's no household help available in Mumbai because all those people who were doing household jobs have left Mumbai because they had nothing to do there. No food, no, no shelter, nothing. They've just left. And now the question comes, are they willing to come back to you? No. I don't think they will be willing to come back to you. And even if they come back to you, will they be getting the same salary, same honor, same respect or not? Is again a big question to be asked. And then uh, in, in, in terms of doing one thing, Indian government has done a great thing. That's the, 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 the money transfer that we did for the uh, poor. And hats off to uh, our Prime Minister, uh, Professor uh, Mr. Uh, Modiji and his team. What we have been able to do is we have been able to do a few things which UN uh, started asking later on, but our government had already done it. But one more thing that they are asking is now that this money should not be transferred to the men of the house. This money should be transferred to the women of the house. I, I now remember of one thing. One, uh, one afternoon, I found one of my class four employees drunk with a very expensive dog moving around and, and uh, acting like Amitabh Bachchan. He said, I am Amitabh Bachchan of Revensa. So what I did is I suspended him and I wrote on that suspension order that the money will be transferred to his wife's account, not to his account's salary. And uh, because he, he, he is not a very influential person, everybody forgot that his uh, suspension has to be revoked also. Then when I came to know after two months that his suspension has not been revoked, and I found out that the wife came to tell me, sir, he, you may give him his, uh, he gave his uh, job back, but the money should come to my account because this helps me in... Uh, in asking him to have little less alcohol as compared to what he has been doing. So uh, putting money into the women's hand is perhaps one of the things that we need to learn during this pandemic time. I do it. I don't know what is my basic salary. My wife knows, wife knows it better. And uh, the other thing that has come to, uh, I think one of our uh, speakers did uh, make a, made a mention of it. What has become very difficult now is the girls not going to the school has become a uh, serious vulnerable issue for the girls. What we have felt that girls are po uh, for girls, schools are possibly safe environments. Uh, many people may not uh, know this, may not even accept this, but this is true. And my learned uh, professors in the subject would agree with me that the schools are possibly one of the escape points for the girls from the uh, the vulnerability or the uh, or the kind of uh, tortures they get. What is being felt now in the, that, uh, that, that the reports coming now, the teen is pregnancy and unwanted pregnancy has become more now worldwide. This, see, I'm, I'm so, uh, so much confused that during pandemic time, people have been collecting all kinds of data and such kind of data somebody will collect during COVID time, I never knew. That what, is, what has happened is the number of uh, those unreported, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, malpractices or, or you can say unreported uh, if I use the common word that people use on unreported rapes going on is has become more as compared to what it was happening in pre-pandemic time. Because the pandemic time, there's nobody coming and asking nobody to go and complain about things also. And uh, what has come up more is for the uh, girls, they are more put to domestic duties now for taking care of child, or the children who are younger to them, or preparing food at home and doing other things rather than uh, reading books or doing their uh, studies from home. So studies from home is another uh, uh, thing which is uh, for boys only. It's, it may not be for girls in all the places. Uh, any um, uh, particular economic level below that, they will be like that only. And what is more important now, one of my speakers said that if these online classes goes on, then there will be issues where the family has got one connectivity, the boy will be preferred better than the girl to go for that class. Let's say boys should read first 
and then the girl will go for a class. By that time, the online class is already over. If there is one smartphone to share amongst the people in a in a house, it usually goes to the boys who are little elder. In even the father may not get it, but definitely the girl girls in the family will get it only after he gets tired of using that smartphone. So if you are talking in terms of online education, talking in terms of education through technology modes, there are serious issues that people should ask about the girl child, about the girl student in places where things are not available. Or places where it, economic conditions do not permit them to have an equal exposure, uh, equal uh, I mean um, beneficiary as far as using the uh, technology available at home or at the place of work or at the place of in a village. Also, if there is a community television, people would not prefer to listen to that uh, teaching that is coming in television, which is essentially required for the girl child. They will be better going for Ramayana or, or anything else. What now needs is uh, more of a um, serious concern today is immediately after this pandemic, what we will see is we'll see the impact of malnutrition and undernutrition, particularly in children and the mothers. It's, it has been a general weakness of all the ladies to feed the uh, chief of the family more than feeding themselves. So malnutrition, neonatal malnutrition, postnatal malnutrition is something that does not come during pregnancy. It comes before even perceiving the idea of getting pregnant. So all those teenage girls and all those expecting mothers or the mother-to-be who are just married or something like that, who are waiting to become mothers, other people have to be taken care of as far as nutrition is concerned. Otherwise, what will happen is these five, six, seven months of malnutrition will be good enough to cause all kinds of damage to the neonates that are that are there, the, the fetus and then the neonates, and the, or as I should say perinatal uh, age points of the child. So there are millions and millions of people around a single ward that we have used the pandemic. And this has to be a serious concern, both the medical front and at the equity front also. I must thank Asima for uh, conceiving this idea of having this uh, webinar. And I must uh, thank all the speakers who found out time from the very, very busy schedule and uh, be with us and and tell us uh, in depth the, the scenario now and the way we have to uh, face this. I'm extremely happy about it. But before I close down, I must say that uh, there is never a beginning and there is never an end as far as respecting the mother or the women is concerned. It's always there. It will be there. But the only thing is that we have to hammer sometimes when it is going out of our mind and brain. We have to make people become more and more conscious about such things that if you are neglecting the women folk now, is going to neglect the entire generation to come. So what we are now seeing or what you are, whatever we are doing is we are waiting for a very terrible and terrific time because we have been neglecting the women in present time. So thank you very much for giving this opportunity to speak to you. If I have done any justice to the time that I have spent, I am very happy. Even otherwise, this has been a very interesting and very informative uh, webinar. And I, I sincerely, with, with all respect, thank all the four ladies who made their uh, time out to do it. But one thing I want to ask all of you, Bikram uh, will, is not asked this question. Why do ladies always think that women empowerment is something that the men should not speak? Please get more men to talk on this. Make the pe male people become more, uh, by speaking, we become committed to the cause. If we are committed to the cause, we do it better. So I, all, all the time I found that there is a women empowerment seminar. They always bring, bring in all the women speakers. There would have been many, many male uh, to be working on women empowerment. And we should find out that. Make the male more responsible than the female themselves. Asking for yourself a very great job. But at the same time, let the other people have to realize from the depth of the heart, from every corner of the brain, 
that this is an extremely important question that the male should address before the female artists. So women empowerment is the job of women. It's not a job of women. I think that's what we would like. Thank you very much and thank you again. Uh, thank you, sir. It's not that March 8th can be the Women's Empowerment Day. 8th August can be Women's Empowerment Day. And today is a day of Women's Empowerment. Every day uh, should be Women's Empowerment Day. Every yes. day, I, I believe every evening, every male should ask himself, did I do anything wrong to a woman or not? You know, you should not have done that. Every day, if you ask yourself, did I do anything wrong? If you remember, when I welcome the students, I say them, the the best thing to learn in life is to understand where the woman says no. I always say, don't do anything which a lady in the house or a girl in the house does not like it to happen. That's the beginning of women empowerment, really. And from there only, actually, we should start. Every small boy, every young boy should be taught about it. And you understand where the lady, without saying excuse me, does say excuse me, and you understand that excuse me is a big word. After that, you are only killed and nothing else. So that's very important. Right, sir. Uh, as you rightly said, caregivers are more women than men. Uh, yes, it's difficult to measure the extent to which people are infected and the extent to which people um, are affected. And the ideas that you uh, highlighted on women working from home are actually convincing. Uh, with this, uh, oh, we now open the house uh, uh, for uh, question answer. We feel indeed elated to uh, go through constant and continuous comments in the feedback. Um, the uh, reading uh, comments in chat box is indeed an experience of sheer delight. It is very difficult uh, to um, respond to all uh, the, the uh, questions that have come. But we'll try to um, take uh, uh, a few of them. We'll try to accommodate as much as possible. Uh, 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 first, we, uh, uh, there are some common questions. Vikram, yes, sir. Vikram, what you can do is you can ask some of the important ones or some, yes. of, some of them which you think the whole uh, uh, participant group should listen to. And there's yes. a lot of the questions. You can pass it on to the speakers, respective speakers. And when you get it, you can revert it back to the person. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, Ask them I, to give their email ID also. I, I, the speak, I'm, um, speaker specific questions I'm telling at once. Then they can respond. To, um, uh, I'm saying they're reading all the questions together and they can uh, respond um, at one go. Uh, <clears throat> few questions, important questions. Uh, this is for uh, 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 Professor Mary Joan. Mary Joan. Ma'am, uh, the, co the question is. Uh, how can we minimize gender disparity in income? And then another question. Uh, <clears throat> there is an increasing domestic violence during pandemic. Why? And what can be done? And <clears throat> another question. What measures can the government take to ensure uninterrupted on, uh, availability of reproductive and sexual health care services such as pregnancy care and other services during pandemic. And then, uh, Isita, madam. Isita, madam. Uh, how does corona affect impinge upon tribal women? Then another point to Isita, Isita madam. Uh, it is in many women are migrating from the workplace permanently to family to take care of household um, activities in the absence of maid, domestic maid. Domestic maids have gone. Uh, is there any uh, way for the government to intervene or uh, anything can be done so that these women can retain their livelihood? This is happening mostly in urban areas. Uh, another, it is seen that during pandemic, in the policy formation, women are not taken as an integral component in the decision-making process. It is observed. How can women be made an integral component of the decision-making process during pandemic? Another question to Ishita, madam. Uh, 
uh, why did we fail this time in pandemic? Why were we not prepared for this pandemic? And to Asa, madam, can you have data on how many women have sold their gold and land, gold and land and other assets during pandemic? Um, Bibuti madam, Bibuti madam, uh, lockdown has prevented women from protect, protecting their assets, including land. They have been victims of untold atrocities even by the state. How can the situation be balanced? And second, uh, <clears throat> women do not constitute a homogeneous group. They are a heterogeneous group. Don't you think problems vary from women to women? And don't you think there is an urgent need for a, a target specific approach? And one common question, uh, it is not addressed to any um, resource person. Why is it that countries with female leaders have performed worse than the countries with male leaders in COVID management? Uh, we will... Uh, um, uh, start? The same series. First, Asam, first, Professor Marijun will speak, then Ishita Madam, then Asam Madam, and then Bhuti Madam. Thank you for these questions. Uh, I would like to, but before sort of trying to respond to them, I think we need to be a little cautious on a couple of fronts. One is that. Um, while I have been very, very happy to see the extent to which uh, there has been such a strong response from civil society and on the part of you know, the, the world of academics and scholars has come out with responses to a whole host of issues raised by the pandemic. I, as a researcher, I do think we need to be a little aware of the constraints under which we are now making our claims. We are making our claims, we are, the researches that are being undertaken, whether in the first world or whether in our context, are being undertaken under extraordinary constraints. So I would not take any of the studies that are being done now as the final word. Even the pandemic itself is unfolding and changing its face as we go along. So the fact that we have all, and so, so please bear with us when, you know, of course we may say things are getting reversed. Yes, there are signs of rise in domestic work, uh, the, the domestic uh, violence, but let us be a little cautious when I saw some of the questions they're asking for data and so on. I would say be a little cautious here, you know, ask yourselves when there was no COVID, when there was no pandemic, under what conditions did we do our data? Under what conditions did we do research? How much time did it not take us to come out with our results? So please do not expect that suddenly now, under these conditions where we don't even have access to the field, we are going to come out with robust results about the status of anything. Um, domestic violence is, for instance, the most difficult subject to study. Violence per se is the most difficult subject to study. When the National Family Health Survey gives us data, for instance, on domestic violence, it is very problematic data. We have to be very careful how we interpret that data. If that data tells us that all the poor families and all the scheduled caste families are, you know, the women of those families are, you know, suffering violence, domestic violence, and no middle class families are suffering domestic violence, I would raise a big question mark in terms of the validity and the nature of such data. Who is going to answer you questions about violence? Who is in a position to raise their voice about violence? All right. Whether be middle class, whether be working class. So please, I would request many of us to be a little cautious and careful about what we are saying. What we are indicating are trends. What we are indicating are the voices that get through to us. It is NGOs in the field who probably have relationships to the fields that they are working with uh, and such that they are able to get responses. But I know about studies where, for instance, they found that only those who had a smartphone that was working condition 
were able to get answers to their questions. Half the work, half the people they were interacting with had no phones in the first place, and the and a remaining proportion of those, their phones were no longer able to. They the 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 payment of the of the you know charge had had no longer was no longer functioning, and so there was no answer to be obtained. So all our data now is highly biased, highly provisional, and should be taken in that spirit. All right. So the other thing is. Please be. I know there's a lot of goodwill amongst people who are raising questions. These the problems we are with are gigantic. Do not expect a quick fix solution. Do not expect one little policy by the government is going to solve the problems of malnutrition. Is going to solve. Let us first recognize the extent of the problem. Let us recognize how much of goodwill will be required. Let us recognize that in fact state action so far has already been part of the problem. We already have a situation where half our children are malnourished long before the pandemic came along. So why was that the case in the first place? What was wrong with ICDS programs in the first place? Unless we have a diagnosis of the prior problem, we will not come any closer to finding a solution. So you know these these are my 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 concerns. Disparity in income. Somebody's asking about. Please understand the extent to which disparity in income is a worldwide phenomenon. That women are paid less for the same amount of work, right? We we now have we have a constitution that mandates equal treatment, equal pay. Why is that not able to translate into practice? Please have some sense of those issues so that when we are under pandemic conditions, we can find a slightly better lever. To be able to address those things, I think one of the interesting questions that came was a general question to everyone was about female leadership, and one saw pictures of you know Merkel in 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 Germany and the New Zealand uh, um, the woman in New Zealand and the fact that they seem to be doing so much better than several other men. I think let us be a little cautious here too. We are very 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 small numbers of women leaders in the world. Very small compared to the vast majority. I don't know if there are even five percent of nations in the world have a female head of government. Ask yourselves, what does it take to become a head of a government in the current moment? The good reasons might be that they actually have the welfare of people at heart, and therefore they are going to implement policies. I can say this is true of Merkel. It is possibly true. It is certainly true of the New Zealand uh, Prime Minister. That they are already welfare oriented, and hence their thinking is even more sharpened at a time like the by the pandemic. But please, in history, in recent history, we have had women leaders. We've had Aquino in 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 the Philippines. We've had Margaret Thatcher in England. These are women leaders, but they have by no means had the welfare of the citizens at heart. They have been the ones who have introduced some of the most authoritarian, some of the most Gender unfriendly, some of the most inegalitarian policies that we have ever seen. So I would really again ask you: do not have a simplistic notion of an innate gender quality that translates into positive gender outcomes. Even in our own, we could even look in our own country. The some of our chief ministers and so on. I think the best state in India today, as far as COVID is concerned, is Kerala. There is no two ways about it. Kerala was well prepared thanks to prior experience and has done an extremely good job even today. And it is unfortunately a state where we haven't seen women leaders. I would like to see more women leaders in this state. I come from Kerala, and it has been male leadership, but at least that male leadership has shown good leadership during this moment, even if there could have been women. And it has also delegated this male leadership in Kerala has delegated. To others, it has delegated to its uh, health minister, for instance, Shaila Jha. It has delegated to the Kudumbashree women at the very bottom of the system, and they have been in a position to actually act in a way that could make a difference. So, I think we need a much more nuanced way of thinking about the problems we face, our capacity to diagnose those problems, and what it would take to make a difference. Thanks very much. थैंक यू मैडम इसी तरह मैडम यस एस आई कुडंट हियर योर क्वेश्चन सो आई आई एम नाउ बीइंग एबल टू हियर बट 
I was just looking into the chat box. I want to pick up two, three questions which have been raised in the chat box. Uh, other questions around that. One is the very pertinent question of land. That what is happening to land? During these phases, what we find that some are, of, most of the women, most of the population are losers. But we can also identify that there are some gainers in the society also in the pandemic. Who are the gainers? There are some companies who are taking over forest lands, who are converting forest lands to companies and who are acquiring, there have been acquisition of land and uh, forest lands at very low prices and which the it is the what we call the frustrated way to sell. We call it distress, but it is distress as well as frustration. The frustrated way to sell off to whatever prices they get. So this distress sell of forest land, distress sell of land is uh, reorienting the whole land dynamics and land and class relations with respect to women. And this is not the beginning, it was there, but now it is going off in a large scale. So that is adding to my point of indebtedness. That is going to my point, which I refer to indebtedness. There has been a growing indebtedness due to the pandemic. So this is uh, one of the issues which I like to uh, raise at this point of time. And we clearly, as Mary rightly stated, that we clearly do not have all the data regarding it. In fact, one of the questions have, have, have been raised regarding the sale of ornaments also. What we saw in the demonetization, some of the demonetization effects on women are being visible now in the pandemic that there has been a sale of ornaments also. There has been a sale of whatever valuables women held up. This was the reserve which women used to have which they would release under any kind of uh, financial stress, any kind of uh, devastation of the family. So they are uh, uh, adding to all of this. So some of the demonetization effects are also visible with respect to women here. So women selling ornaments, we really don't have data to that. And women in the plight of the women in the informal sector, there is the ISS survey has been referred to. There are lots of studies been coming up also. But what I'm going to uh, point out here is the fact that regarding the very low wages and the abnormal conditions of the work, the kind of the work conditions with which the labor is being employed. Whatever deplorable conditions are there, whatever exploitative rules are there, it is being employed now. So will that become the norm of the new normal? That is the anxious query that I'm putting out here. That I don't go by the word of new normal, but I because pre-COVID was not quite a normal situation as far as the condition of the women laborers are concerned. So it was already we were discussing these problems uh, earlier. So they were not uh, normal. So I, I don't uh, uh, go by the word of new normal. So it was not normal. But will that become the norm, the norms and the practices which we that have been been there, in fact, with the change of the labor codes, with the increase in the number of labor hours from 8 to 12, will that be become the norm? That is the anxious query that I'm putting to. And the third issue which I like to flag up, which has been rightly raised in the chat box I, I, I saw, is that all there is, it's, women are not homogeneous, yes. They form uh, across the caste class, uh, plurality is there, and what we see, the attack against the Dalit Adivasi women have been very much visible during these periods, during the pandemic. The story that I started, that is the story that I refer to, is the Mangala story. She's an Adivasi in the Tamil Nadu village, and Mangalas are there throughout India. So this uh, caste class 
plurality this discrimination which was there was reinstated again the anxious query will that become the norm even after that will that be a, a norm if it is a norm of this quote unquote new normal will that become the norm so uh, these are some of the questions which um, were raised uh, in the chat box and i'm responding to those if there are any others i'll be free to interact but i think we are running out of time as uh, um, the time sh scheduled here uh, you can get me and um, uh, through emails and uh, we can interact for further interactions thank you uh, thank you madam asa madam I think uh, Ushita has answered the, the question that was asked of me. What um, I would like to say at this point of time is that when I started to do some interviews, I started with a disability group. And the first thing that they said on domestic violence was, ma'am, please don't ask me that question. I will tell you when I meet you in person. Mm. Because the phone it does not belong to her. Uh, out of 100, only two women had uh, uh, Android phones, and uh, this phone belonged to the family. They were within the house. So there are certain things that you cannot ask at certain point of time of the pandemic, mm, because most of the time we have to call them, or if you know someone who's underground, whether the panchayat sarpanch or there is someone. So one of the things that as women studies scholars we need to do is to look at the methodology of how we are collecting and what data we are collecting. It is not uh, at this point of time the questions that we are as asking, but what is the methodology that we use in the collection of data? The second thing that we have to do is, and which uh, Ishita mentioned, was the intersectionality. Every woman is not the same. There, there are differences between the women uh, who are, um, in fact, one of the issues that came up uh, when I was doing the study was that uh, where women was concerned, uh, men were getting better jobs in the um, in the urban areas, and we were just told that the education of women was increasing. The women had so much of education. Why is it that when they went to urban migrants, women were there, they did not get jobs? So these are the things that we need to ask. Why is it happening? What is the methodology that we are using? What are the intersectionalities that are there? Uh, whether they are Adivasi women or whether they are Dalit women or uh, LGBTQ or uh, disabled women. We need to break that down in that. And then if you have to ask about gold and land, I think the question should be to whom was it sold? Who are the people who during a pandemic are buying things? So the questions need to be also set in the in the parameters of what we are facing, the, the tragedy that is facing, that some people can still go ahead and uh, mop up the um, whatever that is from poor people. And that there is still a very big gap about uh, the problem that they are facing and what we are providing them with. Not only NGOs, it's the work of the government uh, uh, to also provide to see that uh, these issues do not come up. So all of us together, whether as academics we look at it or whether as uh, NGOs or whether as government, we have to, our, our role should be to see that how do we benefit the people whom we are working with and how, how do we do that? And I think um, this is a good time uh, for us to look at research methodologies and to see um, how these, uh, some of the issues will keep coming for the next 20 years and uh, people will still be asking uh, who did what, why did they do it, what happened to the women. You know, th these issues will, because these are not easy to solve. These are not easy um, to get answers to. But we still need to go ahead and do what we are doing. And I'm thankful to Ashima and to the Vice Chancellor um, for uh, giving this opportunity. And also 
uh, an opportunity to listen to Ishita Mary and uh, Vibhuti uh, because you get different uh, perceptions, different views. And um, most of us, I think, uh, hopefully covered a lot of space today. Thank you, madam. Uh, Vibhuti, madam. Yeah. See, along with the see, land and gold being sold to it, in Western India, you can say even private min microfinance institutions, they were also very predatory and behaved like mercenary. Uh, so I think we need a regulation about them. In the cities, we, we saw that it was people left everything, like 30, 32% of uh, ma uh, reverse migration which took place was of women. Either they were wives or home-based workers or workers in their own right. But they left everything, including utensils, furniture, cooking, gas, everything. And that was purchased by their own neighbors who were the local residents. So in a city like Mumbai, it was a local versus outsider. No, that was, And that has been there for a long time in Bombay. There is, Bombay has a strong history of local. So the local people also bought, local money lenders also took it. So I think the assetlessness among the uh, migrating people that was created as a result. Another thing that the whole question of women not being uh, homogeneous, yes, we accept that there are intersectionalities and our uh, intervention should also be informed by the specific situation. So whatever you are suggesting for the vegetable vendors or uh, home-based workers or uh, handloom workers or uh, fisher folks, that you have to understand the reality and the intervention strategy has to come up. And that's why I think some of the rapid assessment studies i fully don't agree with what mary john has said that the data can't be trusted because i know of the community-based organizations or ngos or trade unions or shgs uh Angadwadi trade union all of them were also while doing relief work and going to the community they were also doing the need assessment study so the micro planning for example vacha is now on the 11th round of relief operation they provide kits for 10 days okay so they started from 25th march until and then these uh, students who are doing who are actually doing the relief work they are community based they also collect the data so that your relief operation is not it is targeted it is the the material you have collected each kit kit costs you 1200 rupees there are 16 items in the relief kit that is not wasted so i think even the data generated at a micro level uh, because of the direct intervention and direct uh, uh, rapport with the community, I think that can also give us some idea of what is happening at the ground level. It can be generalized. What you talk about the slums in Mumbai cannot be said about, say, a uh, community in Bhubaneswar. That is true. But uh, I think certain patterns that are very macro level, I think, yeah, what, what Mary says is correct, that it can be completely trusted. Thank you, madam. Uh, it is indeed a rare, rare privilege to be a part of this uh, stimulating, uh, vibrating, uh, intellectually scintillating uh, uh, discourse on COVID-19 from a gender perspective that dwelt upon a wide range of issues starting from migration, uh, reproductive health, care, livelihood, domestic violence, violence in public spheres, education, child care, food security, human rights to governance. The entire session was indeed engaging and exciting. With this, I now uh, request the convener of this uh, national webinar, uh, Professor Asima Sahu, to propose the vote of thanks. Oh, no. <laughs> this is technical. Uh, she is there. Uh, the technical issue there. Maybe disconnect with you or something. Huh.
is actually connecting. We'll take a minute. See, in the meantime, I can say whatever has happened, uh, of course, health is a very big damage that we have faced, but one good thing has come. We have started using the technology, you know, holding such a seminar where all these uh, stalwarts to be brought together would have been a very big issue, you know, finding people together, getting them together at the same time, in the same place. Uh, is really, now it is possible. Uh, all four of you would not be meeting us in one place. So, okay, Asima is back. Okay. So, I express my deep sense of gratitude to all our uh, resource persons for uh, today's webinar. Uh, I know um, whenever I just wrote to them, they immediately agreed, and it was such a huge relief for me. And. Uh, they flagged up such important issues concerning the women and gender, not only during the pre-COVID times, but also during the COVID time. And I'm sure all our young participants, especially those who are doing their undergraduate studies, must have immensely benefited from their perspectives. And it will definitely make them think and critically reflect over these issues, which will uh, definitely sharpen their understanding about the women and gender issues. Uh, so uh, once again, I thank all our resource persons uh, on behalf of the university. Uh, I also thank our vice chancellor uh, immensely because uh, almost every other day we have a webinar and uh, he's always more than willing to participate in all these webinars, spending almost two to three hours every day. So I am learning from him in this department how to be patient and attend all these webinars. So I also take this opportunity to, attend, to thank all our faculty members from Revencia as well as from other institutions and dear participants who have really encouraged us by their uh, participation and also said these several questions they have raised. Once again, I thank all of you from the bottom of my heart uh, for joining this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we declare this webinar closed. Thank you. <laughs>